السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Welcome to the first session of our four session course on the history, the early history of the Ottoman Empire. In this course, inshallah, over the course of uh, the next four weeks, we are going to take a look at the early development of the Ottoman Empire, uh, understand the history behind it, why did the why was the empire founded in the first place, as well as some of the major motivating factors that caused it to rise to become one of the uh, largest and most important empires in Islamic history. Before we do that, however, we need to start out with a little bit of an introduction to the study of history itself. We need to understand what are the major uh, themes of history? How do we study history? How do we think about things that have happened in the past? So very often, when people begin to study history, they want to gain a unbiased understanding of the events of the past. People want to say, okay, well, we know that a lot of history is written uh, from a Western perspective, or it's written with a particular bias against Islam. So people very often ask about like, what are good sources for us to get the correct history, right? And I, and I wanna put correct here in, quotation marks. And also before we even start, I want to differentiate quite a bit between what we can refer to as Muslim history and Islamic history. We'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. But for the most part, when I'm talking about history here, we'll be talking about post uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and post companions. So we are talking about uh, Muslim history from the decades after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and going onwards. One thing that we need to understand before we start is that history is not just a uh, recollection of events and battles and figures from the past. It's not just a list. It's not just a, um, a linear progression of things that have happened. And if you look at some of the earliest books of history written in Muslim civilization, uh, like for example, the history book of Tabari, um, we find that they are written very differently from the way that modern history is written. Um, in that, for example, a tabari is simply recounting events that happened. And you also find this in, in later books of history like Ibn Kathir and others. In many cases, they actually end up recounting multiple conflicting narrations of the same event. So there will be one thing that happened in a particular year, and usually these books are organized chronologically year by year. So in this year, this sultan took power, then he did this, and he went to this war, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And very often, they're trying to bring together all the possible narrations to give you as wide of a scope in understanding what happened in that particular year. That's not how modern history is written at all. Most modern history books are not trying to just give you every single event that happened in a particular year. Those aren't really history books the way that we understand them. Those are more chronicles. So in modern history writing and, and study, we're not actually very interested in what happened necessarily. In terms of the actual chronology of events, that's not very hard to piece together, uh, especially when we're talking about pretty much all of Muslim history happened in an era where records were kept of everything. It's very different for things like ancient history, right? So if you want to study uh, the, well, the Romans are very well attested to, but if you wanna study, um, you know, the ancient Persians or the ancient Greeks or going back even further, um, you know, 1000, 2000 BC, then actually it is pretty difficult to um, piece together the events. It's difficult to, to figure out who was in charge at what time and what happened when. But for pretty much everything after um, the turn to the common era, so the past 2000 years approximately, we have a pretty good record of what happened. So studying history is not about learning what happened. It's about learning why things happened. It's about understanding when we say that the Ottoman Empire rose in the year 1299 and within a hundred years it had expanded into the Balkans and much of Anatolia, and we'll talk about uh, these things a, a little bit later. It's not knowing that that happened, it's knowing why that happened. Now, this is actually a very difficult question to answer. 
And this is where you have to recognize that people are going to write different history accounts based off of different perspectives. And to illustrate this, just think about the modern world and modern events that happen. So taking, for example, um, the United States' invasion of Iraq in 2003. Now, we all know that the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. That's indisputable. We have so much evidence of that because it's in the modern era. You can't dispute it. We know that that happened. Now, the question is, why did that happen? Right? And we can come up with a number of different answers. We can say, well, um, the United States wanted uh, access to Iraq's oil fields. Right? So they invaded in order to expand their own economic prospects. That's not wrong. It's certainly not wrong at all. It's accurate. But that can't be the whole story. We know that that's not the whole story. We can also say that there were people in uh, the Bush administration that really genuinely believed in the ideals of democracy, for example, and the ideals of um, post-enlightenment liberalism. And they really believed that these ideals should be exported by force even, right? This is uh, modern neoconservatism. Um, so there is a economic motive, which is to expand America's oil reserves. And there's a intellectual motive, which is to expand American liberalism. There might be other motives as well. You might say that, uh, you know, the military industrial complex wanted greater um, or larger contracts from the federal government. So they pushed very strongly for another war. You might say that, oh, well, that was um, uh, part of rooting out terrorism in the aftermath of 9-11. Now, these are all different perspectives of something that happened less than 20 years ago. So when people today, right, or in 2003 or any time in the past 20 years, write about the Iraq war, depending on which angle they're looking at, they're writing about different motivations for why that thing happened. So now when historians in 100 years or 500 years or 1,000 years want to write the history of the Iraq war in the early 21st century, they're going to have a number of different perspectives to pull from. They're going to be digging up perhaps newspapers with editorials saying, you know, we need to invade Iraq for its economic, um, uh, for its oil reserves or whatever it might be. And they're going to use that as a primary source when they're writing history books about the early 21st century. So that is an example of various biases just about something that happened very recently. So now when we look back at history, whether it is Muslim history or otherwise, we have to recognize that different writers and different historians are going to look at different aspects of um, human society as explanations for why things happened. So for example, a Marxist historian would look at any empire rising or falling throughout human history and try to explain it through the lens of Marxism, through the lens of economic history. Marxism, as you may know, is, is all about the idea that humanity has been plagued with this class conflict from the beginning of time until today between the proletariats and the bourgeois. So if you are a committed Marxist, or even if you just believe that that is the best way to explain human history, you're going to look at that and say, okay, well, this is how, this is why things happened the way that they did in history. If you are a social historian, you are not going to look at the economic side of things. You're going to say, well, the Ottoman Empire rose because of the um, strength of the social fabric between the Turks and the various other ethnic groups in the Balkans and Anatolia. If you're a political historian, you're going to take a look at um, the political institutions that the Ottoman Empire founded um, and, and was based on and say that that's the reason why the, why the empire rose. So my point in going over all of this is just to introduce everybody to this idea that searching for some kind of uh, mythological correct history, some kind of uh, supposedly unbiased history that we can rely on and say this is the correct answer and everything else is biased is a bit too simplistic. And that's really not how a responsible historian or a student of history should approach studying anything, whether it is the Ottoman Empire or any other Muslim empire, or really any other um, era of human history. Again, I have to re-emphasize this does not apply to 
uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions. I would never advocate using modern Western historical methods to analyze the era of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam simply because that is beyond the pale of um, regular human civilization. So now, if we are to say that every historian comes at history from a particular perspective or a par particular bias, the question is now, what are we going to do over the, over the course of the next four weeks? One thing that is very often neglected in the history, uh, in understanding human civilization in general, as well as particular, particularly Muslim history, is the importance of religion and religious scholarship as a motivating factor for why things happened the way that they did. Again, an economic historian would look at the rise of the Ottoman Empire and say that the reason that it rose is because of uh, the trade routes that connect Asia and Europe and Africa right at where the um, apex of the Ottoman Empire was. And because of that, they were able to make a lot of money. And through the ideas of mercantilism, uh, the Ottomans were able to, to expand. I'm not really interested in that. That's not to say that that's necessarily wrong. Of course it isn't, right? That, that definitely played a role. But what we're interested here in here is the role of religious scholarship in the foundation of the Ottoman Empire. And if, I, if, if we want to sum it up in, in one sentence, it is to say that the Ottoman Empire never would have been what it is had it not been for the role of religious scholarship and the role of the Madaris, the religious uh, education, the role of the Sufis in particular. These are all things that we're going to talk about at length over the course of the next uh, few weeks. Now, um, if you attended uh, Sheikh Amin's uh, class on the Risala al Qushayriya uh, last Thursday, which if you haven't, uh, you certainly should. Uh, it's on the YouTube page and, and you can watch it. Um, he mentioned, by way of example, the, uh, the reign of Nizam al-Mulk, who was the Grand Vizier of the Seljuk Sultanate. And we'll talk about the Seljuks next week. Uh, we'll touch on them a little bit uh, today and then really get into them in the run-up to the Ottomans next week. The Seljuks were a Turkic empire, kind of the predecessors to the Ottomans, but most of their bureaucrats were Persians. The Persians have a very long history of being uh, very efficient bureaucrats, even going before uh, the rise of, of Islam in the, in the seventh century. So Nizam al-Mulk was a Persian bureaucrat who worked for the Turkic uh, Seljuk state. And he established a series of schools, religious schools, madaris, throughout the Seljuk state, the most prominent being the one in Baghdad. And that was where Imam al-Ghazali was employed by Nizam al-Mulk. And Ghazali and his works, obviously, as we know, he is one of the greatest minds of Muslim history. He's one of the greatest scholars that we have ever had in our history. The work that he did, as well as the work of uh, his teacher, Juwaini, as well as works of dozens, if not hundreds of other scholars of the Seljuk era is really what, pro what propped up the Seljuks. It's what made them powerful. Now, again, that is not to say that it is the only thing. The Seljuks were very powerful militarily. They were powerful economically, et cetera, et cetera. But specifically when it comes to Muslim history, Muslim civilization, we cannot overemphasize the role of religious scholarship in the formation of Muslim states. A Muslim state cannot survive without a viable and powerful religious establishment. And Sheikh Min touched on this um, last Thursday in his, uh, in his class on Risal al Qushayriya, and we will, we will emphasize this very strongly going forward when talking about uh, the Ottoman Empire. Now, one of the reasons that I really want to emphasize religious uh, scholarship, because in the modern world where most history is written uh, in the West and most of that being written in English, most historians are not very interested in, um, in the role of religious scholarship in the course of history. Most historians, I would argue, are probably more focused on economic history um, great man history has kind of died out. That's not really a, a very um, viable uh, course through which to understand uh, human civilization. But economic history, political history, social history are very, very uh, 
powerful. Religious history is generally neglected. And part of the reason for that is because the Enlightenment and the post-Enlightenment European world emphasizes materialism so much, right? We see this, we see this in the history of um, Western philosophy that really shifted away from the metaphysical. They're no longer interested in questions of what is beyond what we can perceive. They're not interested in questions of God. They're not interested in questions of religious belief. They're just interested in things that we can measure, things like psychology, things like biology, things like economics. So religious motivations for why things happen in history tends to be kind of neglected. Um, whereas, as I mentioned, you can't do that with Muslim history. You're, you're simply missing a huge portion of uh, Muslim society uh, and the reasons why things happen in, in certain ways. So that's one of the big things that we're going to emphasize going forward, uh, looking at the Ottoman Almiyya, which was the, no, the name that they had for their um, religious establishment. Another very important thing that, I, that we will talk about is the cyclical nature of Muslim civilization and Muslim societies. Now, uh, to preface this, people tend to um, look at the modern condition of the Muslim world and kind of get very down, right? And they look at, you know, oppression of Muslims throughout the world, and they look at the fact that Muslim countries are not united. Uh, we have, what, 50, 60 some odd um, Muslim countries that are disunited and very often quarreling with each other, if not in uh, situations of outright war. Muslims on the world stage are kind of very often an afterthought. Uh, we are not a big power the way that the United States or Russia or China would be. But when you take a look at Muslim history, you take a long view of everything that has happened over the course of the pa past 1400 years, and you realize that actually today is, first of all, not necessarily exceptional. Yes, oppre oppression exists today, and, and that is uh, a travesty. But compared to some other eras in Islamic history, um, we're actually doing pretty well, relatively speaking. And you also realize that everything is cyclical. We'll talk uh, at the end of today's session about Ibn Khaldun, who is perhaps one of the greatest um, Muslim historians of all time. And his theory of how every empire and every civilization has a natural lifespan during which it rises, it has uh, some kind of a golden age, and then it naturally declines and dies and is replaced by another civilization. So with the Ottomans, we are going to see, you know, spoiler alert, if you don't know, the Ottoman Empire does not exist anymore. It did rise, it had a golden age, and then uh, it fell. Um, if it, its final end was in 1922, so relatively not that long ago. But the Ottomans were actually born out of an era that was um, incredibly uh, 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 painful for Muslim civilization. And I would argue that what it was born out of was a time much more difficult than the time that we have right now. But that's the cyclical nature of Islamic history that you have these rises and, and, then the, and then a fall that comes after it, which is then followed by another rise. And from that point now, we can go to, um, just one second. we can start talking about the history that leads to the rise of the Ottoman Empire. And you should be able to see right now a map of the Mongols the Mongol conquests that precede the Ottoman Empire by about a century. Now, this seems kind of counterintuitive. If we want to understand the, the early history of the Ottoman Empire, we actually have to start thousands of miles away from the, the foundation of the Ottoman state, and we have to start about a century before. So to give you just kind of a um, geographic overview of the region that we're talking about, if you look on the left side of this map, right in the center of the Anatolian Peninsula, modern day Turkey, we have the Seljuks of Rum, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about them next week, but that green area where it says the Seljuks of Rum, of Rum right next to the Byzantine Empire, that's where the Ottoman state is founded in the Western part of Anatolia. On the other side of the map, we see the Mongol heartland, where the Mongol empire actually comes from and uh, where it begins its expansion. 
So we obviously, when talking about the Mongols, have to start with Chinggis Khan, right? Chinggis Khan is the founder of the Mongol Empire. The Mongols actually, um, relative to other civilizations um, before them, were kind of an afterthought. If Chinggis Khan never existed, we really would not be talking about the Mongols at all. They were a relatively minor tribe that lived north of the Gobi Desert, um, north of modern day China, roughly equivalent with modern day, the modern day nation state of Mongolia. So around the year 1200, we have Chinggis Khan uniting the various Mongol tribes, as well as bringing under his authority some of the other tribes that are around them, like the Tatars and the Oyarats and the Kyrgyz and, and others. Um, an interesting side note, um, when you look at Muslim accounts of the Mongols, they're almost never referred to as the Mongols. They're almost always referred to as the Tatars. And that was because the people, the Arabs and Persians who were conquered by the Mongols, you know, never had even heard of them before. So they mistook the Mongols for the Tatars, just another one of those tribes in the uh, steppe of Northern Asia. So in any case, the Mongols under Chinggis Khan, they are united and they begin a um, campaign of conquest of pretty much everything that they see, beginning primarily with Northern China. And I know that there's a ton of stuff going on on this map right now, and, and it can be uh, quite overwhelming. But if you just look at um, Karakorum, the, the kind of heartland of where the Mongols are founded, you can see all these red arrows coming out of that. And those are the campaigns of Chinggis Khan himself. He begins with, with the conquest of northern China. The reason why he is able to be so successful is the Mongol pattern of conquest is really um, uh, uh, ruthless. And, and really effective, right? So whenever they would arrive at a city, generally they would give the defenders of that city two choices. It would say, you either join us and basically you know, uh, uh, get rid of your army, get rid of your, your government, everything is subsumed into the Mongol empire and we're gonna go on to the next city and you're coming with us to conquer your neighbors. Or if you fight back against us, we are going to massacre your entire city. In some cases, they massacred entire populations of cities, even including things like the livestock and the dogs. I mean, complete, ruthless uh, conquests. But because of the fact that they did that a few times, they were pretty persuasive for people who uh, came after, right? So after you go and destroy a city and then you go and find the city and next to them, you say, hey, this is what we did to your neighbors you can join us or have the same fate as them. So because of that, that's one of the reasons why the Mongols are able to expand so quickly and conquer major population centers um, in China. Now, after conquering Northern China, Chinggis Khan turns his attention to the West and he is able to conquer, he begins to conquer Muslim states in the, uh, in, in the Central Asian steppe. So think about countries today like uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all the Stan countries. That was where Chinggis Khan turns his attention to next. And that area was ruled by the Khawarizm Shah Empire. Um, we don't really have to go too much into the details of this. The long story, uh, the short story is that Chinggis Khan completely obliterates the Khawarizmian Empire. It ceases to exist by the 1220s. In 1227, Chinggis Khan dies and rulership over the, uh, the Mongol empire goes to his son, Ogedai. Now at this point, here we have kind of a thick uh, red boundary that generally shows you the extent of the Mongol empire at the death of Chinggis Khan. I mean, at this point, it is already the biggest empire that has ever existed in human history in terms of land mass. Um, and I believe even till this day, no empire, perhaps the British in the early 20th century might have been a little bit bigger than, um, than the Mongols. But up to the 13th century, nothing in human history was ever this expansive. But under Ogedai, Chinggis Khan's son, the focus of the Mongol empire shifts. They no longer really focus much on conquering Muslim lands. They go back to China and begin to conquer central and southern China, as well as a number of raids into 
uh, what's now considered Russia and Eastern uh, Europe. So places like Poland, Hungary, those areas are now dealing with Mongol conquests. After the death of Ogedai, we have um, eventually we have, by the uh, 1250s, we have the rise of Monkey Khan. You don't need to know all of these names. I mean, they're, they're really kind of um, besides the point, but the important person that you should know about is Hulagu Khan. This is Monkey's brother that is assigned by the great Khan um, Monkey to conquer the Muslim world. So he is sent to basically finish the job that Chinggis Khan starts. And he invades into the rest of Persia, right? So looking at this map over here where it says Ilkhanate, we'll talk about the Ilkhanate in just a minute. He pushes into Persia and Iraq and he conquers the city of Baghdad in the year 1258. Now the destruction of Baghdad is particularly important. This is not just the destruction of any other city. Baghdad had been the, the capital of the uh, Abbasid Empire, uh, the Abbasid Khilafa, as well as the most populous city in the world, probably uh, the world. There, there might've been some cities in China that uh, would have been bigger. Estimates say that around 2 million people might have been killed in the course of about two weeks by the Mongols when they conquered the city of Baghdad. I mean, this is a huge shock to the Muslim system, right? In more ways than one. Before we really talk about the Abbasid, so I want to emphasize kind of looking at this map over here, um, we have the kind of big borders of the Mongol empire itself, but the Mongols after uh, Chinggis Khan, a couple of decades afterwards, it kind of begins to splinter into four different Khanates. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the empire of the great Khan. Theoretically, the ruler of the uh, great Khanate was the emperor of the entire Mongol empire. He was the first among equals, you could say. This is also known as the Yuan dynasty of China, right? Because they conquer China and then the Mongols kind of get subsumed into Chinese culture and they become kind of like another um, dynasty in the long history of Chinese um, uh, uh, kingship. We then have three other Khanates, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, which rules over much of what's now southern uh, Russia, as well as many of the Stan countries, the Chagatai Khanate, and the Il Khanate. So these are the four constituents of the Mongol Empire. The Golden Horde, the Chagatai Khanate, and the Il Khanate end up actually converting to Islam. Berki Khan, who was the Khan of the Golden Horde, uh, was uh, the, f if not the first, then one of the first big khans to convert to Islam. But eventually, all three of these convert to Islam. Now, if you ask somebody like Ibn Taymiyyah a century later, he's not really very convinced by their conversion to Islam. In any case, it does take quite a while for their conversion to Islam to really have much of an effect on the way that these khanates operate. But you know. In the interest of not looking at history through a black and white dichotomy type lens, where we say, well, this is good and this is bad. Yes, we look at the Mongols and we can say, obviously they brought destruction to the Muslim world that was um, really unprecedented um, in human history. But as it relates to Islam, they actually ended up spreading Islam to some areas where it had never existed before, particularly the Khanate of the Golden Horde. After they convert to Islam, they end up bringing Islam to new areas where that had previously been entirely foreign to Islam. So for example, in Southern Ukraine, um, or I suppose now uh, Russia, uh, the Crimean Peninsula, there till this day, you have Muslims known as the Crimean Tatars. And those are Muslims who are descendants of the Golden Horde who had converted to Islam. And, to, and the Crimean Tatars end up having their own uh, uh, Khanate, that's concurrent with the Ottoman Empire and was allied with the Ottoman Empire at a certain point in time. But Islam would not have existed there had it not been for the Mongols kind of ironically or counterintuitively conquering that area and then converting to Islam. Similarly, the Mongols, um, they tended to not really care much for religion. Uh, in terms of personal practice, most of them were uh, kind of Buddhists, uh, but also they, they had an affinity for Nestorian Christianity, 
but they were not necessarily anti-Islam. They were just kind of anti-everybody. So whenever they would conquer an area, they had no problem using the populations that they conquered. So once they conquer Persia, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the Persians have a very long history of being very effective bureaucrats. So because of that, the Mongols end up forcibly taking a lot of Persian Muslims out of Persia and taking them all the way to uh, mainland China and forcing them to work for the uh, Yuan dynasty in China. And that's one of the reasons that we have a fairly large um, Muslim minority till this day in China. I'm not talking about the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are in the western part of China. I'm talking about the Hui. The Hui are uh, essentially ethnically Chinese, but they claim their heritage all the way back to Persians who were forced to go to um, China by the Mongols. So in many ways, although the Mongols are a huge uh, scourge upon Muslim society, they end up expanding Islam in a number of ways that's uh, kind of unique. But now we need to talk about the Abbasids. All right. And in order, to, in order to do that, we need to take a look at a timeline of Muslim rulership. We need to trace this idea of Khilafah, and we need to understand what we mean by Khilafah in particular. So as we all know, after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the year 11 after Hijrah, uh, 632 in the um, Gregorian calendar, we have the, the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, followed by Umar, Uthman, and Ali. This goes all the way to the year 41 after Hijra, or 661 in the uh, Miladi, in the Gregorian calendar. After the assassination of Ali, radiallahu anhu, by the Khawarij, we have a split. Muawiyah assumes rulership over the Muslim world. Muawiyah, as you may know, was the uh, cousin of Uthman. He comes from the Umayyad family, which even before Islam was known for their prowess at governance. So he takes power and he has his capital in Damascus. At first, he is opposed by Ali's son, Al-Hasan. After a few months, Al-Hasan gives up any um, claim to authority and he allows the Muslim world to pass under the rulership of the Umayyads. Now, one thing that is uh, one major change that the Umayyads make is that they shift the Khilafah towards a hereditary kingship. So when Muawiyah dies, his son Yazid takes power. And when his son Yazid dies, then Yazid's son Muawiyah II takes power. And then when Muawiyah II I believe he was only in power for a couple of years and he wasn't interested in, in ruler in being in charge anyways. It, sh it moves to another branch of the Umayyad family, but it's still within the family. And the Umayyads are in power for a little bit less than 100 years. Around the year 750, um, well, in the year 747, there is a Abbasid revolution. The Abbasids are another, tri another clan of uh, Quraysh that are more closely related to the Prophet وسلم, than the Umayyads are, and that's one of the reasons that they claimed uh, a greater right to rule. We don't, we don't need to get into all of the details here, but what's important to see here is that there's a shift. From the Khilafah Rashida to the Umayyads, everything changes. Under Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, we can say that those four had political leadership as well as religious leadership. With the rise of Muawiyah, the political and religious leadership shifts, or it splits, I should say. Religious leadership goes to the realm of the ulama. Now, obviously, the first four khulafa, Abu Bakr, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, all of them were ulama. I mean, they were ulama par excellence. We know this. But starting with the Umayyads, the ruler is not necessarily a alim. In most cases, they are not. The preservation of the religion goes to the religious scholars. And this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier with regards to the split between or the differentiation between Islamic history and Muslim history. Islamic history is the history of the Prophet ﷺ and the Khulafa, the first four Khulafa. Muslim history is everything that happens after that. We don't take our deen from sultans and rulers and things like that. And this is one of the big 
hurdles that I think a lot of Muslims have to jump when understanding and looking at Muslim history. Very often we want to look at Muslim history and, and look for uh, examples that we can emulate. Right. So we look at just rulers and say, I want to be like that guy. I mean, this guy was known to be uh, uh, a great mind and he knew so many different languages and he was so just. And during his reign, the empire expanded or blah, 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 blah. That's wonderful and all. But those are not the people that we take our religion from. We take our religion from the scholars of Islam itself. And this is the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. Right, not the sultans. In some few exceptional cases, we do have rulers that are also religious scholars. So, for example, if you look at Tabaqat um, al-Shafi'i al-Kubra of Subki, Tabaqat works are biographical dictionaries. So you can have biographical dictionaries of poets, of um, of fuqaha, of uh, religious scholars, of Sufis, of whoever. So Subki writes a biographical dictionary of all of the great Shafi'i scholars up till his point. And amongst those Shafi'i scholars, he includes Salah al-Din, who I'm, I think perhaps everybody knows about the, the great um, general and sultan who ends up liberating uh, Masjid al-Aqsa from the Crusaders, right? But he's an exception because he was actually a scholar before he became the sultan. For the most part, scholars and sultans, beginning with the, with the Umayyads, are different groups entirely. Now, one thing that's really important to understand is under the Umayyads and the Abbasids, there's this theoretical sovereignty over the entire Muslim world. All right, so the Umayyads, yes, they expand. And that's one of the unique things about the Umayyads. If you only know one thing about the Umayyad Khilafah is that it expanded, right? It, it brought Islam to Northern, um, North Africa, it brought Islam to El Andalus, to modern day Spain and Portugal. It expanded Islam also into um, the Indian subcontinent at the hands of uh, Muhammad bin Qasim. But after the Abbasid revolution in the year 750 um, Gregorian, the Abbasids don't really expand, right? They just maintain the lands that had already been conquered but there's also a branch of the Umayyads that break away from the Abbasids that rule over Muslim Spain. So beginning in the year 750, there is already a, a loss of Muslim political unity. And starting from that point until the modern day, there has never been one united Muslim empire that rules over the entire Muslim world. That's a fantasy, right? People tend to think about like, oh, there was this, uh, unified Khilafah beginning with Abu Bakr and ending with Abdul Majid II in 1924. And since 1924, everything has fallen apart. That's, that's a complete fallacy. And it's not congruent with history at all. Beginning in 750, you already have a split between the Umayyads and Abbasids. And even amongst the Abbasids, within 200 years of them taking power, they lose actually a lot of a practical authority over the Muslim world. And what I want to emphasize here is, the differ is a difference between theoretical sovereignty and practical sovereignty. So we can kind of take a look at this map right here uh, really, really quickly of the Abbasid Khilafah around the year 820. We can see their capital in the city of Baghdad and everything that is green on this map is under for the most part, the direct control of the Abbasid Khilafah. Uh, off the western side of this map, uh, quite a bit away, you would have the Umayyads in Spain who are not under the control of the Abbasids. But for the most part, we can just understand that the Abbasids are in charge of everything. But this is what it looks like around the year 900. Big difference here, right? What happens is that the Abbasids kind of lose a uh, level of control over the provinces of the Abbasid Empire, right? You can kind of say this would be similar to America's 50 states no longer really caring about the central government in Washington, DC. Now, all of these different regions were still theoretically under the sovereignty of the Abbasids, meaning if you were the Tulunid ruler in uh, Fustat in Egypt, you, would, you were the sultan, 
But theoretically, you would say, yeah, I'm not really in charge. The Abbasid Khalifa is in charge. The guy in Baghdad is my boss. But there would, in practice, be really no connection between the two. So the Abbasid Khilafah kind of fragments and disintegrates. And we can see here a number of different dynasties. And this is just in the year 900. Uh, you go a little bit further in history. Um, by the mid 10th century, you find the Seljuks that end up conquering a, a, a large portion of this, the Fatimids, which are an Ismaili um, state, which is totally unrelated to uh, uh, Sunni Muslim history. They end up conquering North Africa, and that's another story altogether. But the important thing that we need to understand here is that all of these regions still recognize, theoretically, the role of the Abbasid Khilafah. For example, Salah al-Din, who I just mentioned a few minutes ago, when he comes to power and he is now ruling over Egypt and Palestine and Syria, he sends a letter to the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad saying, you know, my name is Yusuf ibn Ayyub. I have conquered these lands and I rule over them justly. Do I have your permission to rule over these lands? And the Abbasid Khalifa, I mean, he really has no power. In many points in Abbasid history, he's just kind of a prisoner in the palace in Baghdad. He has no authority whatsoever. So they always sign off. They say, yes, by the fact that I am the Abbasid Khalifa, I give you authority to rule over whatever lands. Another good example of this is uh, another famous Yusuf, uh, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, who is a Amazir um, ruler of the Murabitun movement in uh, modern day Morocco and Mauritania and uh, Spain and Portugal even though he's really, really far away from where the Abbasids have power. I mean, he could do whatever he wants, but he still recognizes the theoretical authority of the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad. Now, with the Mongol destruction of Baghdad, everything changes. Because when the Mongols conquer Baghdad, they kill everybody, including the Abbasid Khalifa and his entire family. So essentially, the Abbasid Khilafah is abolished. It no longer exists after the year 1258. And this is really one of the things that's very hard for a lot of Muslims to, to get their head around, because we're told very often this, uh, this false history of the Khilafah, that it was a continuous, wonderful, great thing, uh, and every Khalifa had power and was respected and things like that. And, and that's simply not the case. In 1258, it does not exist anymore. Now, a couple years later, you do have somebody who pops up in Cairo who claims to be a Abbasid, right? And he tells the Mamluks, and we'll talk about the Mamluks in a second. Um, he tells the Mamluks, you know, I am, I think, like the cousin or the brother of the Abbasid Khalifa who's killed in Baghdad by the Mongols a couple years ago. So now I am next in line to be the Khalifa. And the Mamluks kind of prop him up and they say, okay, this is the Khalifa. And they give their bay'ah, they give their um, pledge of allegiance to him but he is entirely unrecognized outside of the Mamluk borders. No other Muslim state, no other Muslim empire in the Muslim world, with very, very few exceptions, recognizes the Abbasid in Cairo, right? So 1258, essentially, we have an end to the idea of Khilafah. I think we only have three or four cases of people sending a letter to Cairo saying to the Abbasid, in Cairo asking for permission to rule. Generally, it just does not, that, that um, type of uh, uh, authority simply does not exist anymore. Now, with regards to the Mamluks, I'll, I'll briefly talk about them for a second because they are very important. You know, you might be wondering after 40 minutes now, uh, we have, we barely kind of touched on the Ottomans, but all of this, I promise, please stick with me. This does lead up to, uh, and this is uh, pertinent information that we need to know if we want to know anything about the Ottomans. Um, the Mamluks, if you know Arabic, uh, Mamluk in Arabic means one who is owned, somebody who is a slave. The Mamluks are a unique dynasty um, in that they are a slave dynasty. And originally they had been the slaves of the Ayyubids, which is the dynasty that was founded by Salah al-Din. And when the Mongols conquer Baghdad, the Mamluks, the, the slaves of the Ayyubid dynasty, they overthrow the Ayyubids and they take power themselves and they establish a new system in which when a sultan dies, the next sultan is not his son. The next sultan is actually another one of the slaves of 
the Sultan himself. So don't think of slavery here the same way that we tend to think of slavery in the West, this kind of chattel slavery where slaves are meant to do menial type work. Uh, the way that this works is that these would be slave children that are brought up in the palace that are educated uh, to a much higher level than um, free people. And then when they become adults, they generally serve various roles in the government as advisors or as military leaders or, uh, or, or whatever it might be. And then when the Sultan dies, another one of those slaves is kind of elected to become the next Sultan. So that's why it's known as the Mamluk uh, Sultanate. There was another example of a Mamluk Sultanate within the Delhi Sultanate, which is unrelated to the Mamluks of Egypt. But in any case, the important thing that we need to understand here is that the Abbasid Khalifa under the authority of the Mamluks has no power. He lives in a palace in Cairo and whenever a new Mamluk Sultan comes to power, he gives a nominal pledge of allegiance to the Abbasid uh, Caliph, to the Abbasid Khalifa, but that's it. He has no role other than to kind of sign off on whoever the Mamluk Sultan is. Now, the Seljuks in Anatolia don't recognize him. The Delhi Sultanate doesn't recognize him. The Ilkhanate certainly doesn't recognize him. Um, the various Muslim dynasties of the Maghrib, of North Africa and, uh, uh, and Al-Andalus, they don't recognize him at all. This Abbasid Khalifa is a very different type of Khilafah from the earlier Abbasid Khilafah. So now, the question is, what does any of this have to do with the Ottoman Empire? Why does any of this matter? We can think of the Mongols as a reset button for Muslim history. Right. In the same way that at the uh, ascension of Muawiyah in the year 661, after the assassination of Ali by the Khawarij, that is a fundamental shift. The Khilafah is no longer a unification of the political and religious uh, uh, authorities. It, is, it now splits into political authorities being the Umayyads and religious authorities being the ulama. The Mongols fundamentally change everything. Before the Mongols. If you wanted to be recognized as a legitimate ruler, you had to be signed off by the Abbasid in Baghdad. And the way that you would ex that the way that you would exhibit that you have the Abbasid's uh, permission is that the Friday khutbah is read in his name, the Abbasid Khalifa, and you mint coins in his name. So we have a lot of surviving coins from various dynasties, and uh, for example, the Ayyubids that will have the name of Salah al-Din, and on the other, uh, other side of the coin, it'll have the name of the Abbasid Khalifa in Baghdad. After 1258, that's, that's kaput. That doesn't exist anymore. Nobody is recognizing the authority of the Abbasid in Cairo. So now, the old rules of sovereignty don't exist anymore. It's now a wild west. There is now room for new ideas. And this is one of the hallmarks of Muslim civilization is that Muslims are creative in terms of how they adapt to changing circumstances while still remaining within the broad confines of Islamic norms and the Sharia. So now that the Abbasids are gone, the question is what kind of rulership are we going to have? We obviously don't want the Mongols to be in charge and as the Mongols convert to Islam, that becomes less of a problem to begin with. But where does authority come from? Authority used to come specifically from the Abbasids and now what's going to happen? One of the things that does happen is we see a rise in the importance of the Sufis, right? And this is immediately after the lifetime of the greatest uh, Sufi of all time, Sultan al uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar Ibn Arabi. Right? Ibn Arabi dies, I think, um, around 15, um, around 15 or, or 16 years before the, the conquest of Baghdad. And, and his students are still really important in the aftermath of the Mongol destruction. People like Sadr al-Din al-Qunawi, uh, people like Jalal al-Din al-Rumi. I mean, these are people who have a huge level of influence on Muslim society. So there is a bit of a shift away from focusing on political authority towards focusing on spiritual authority, focusing on how can we look to, towards a, uh, uh, a spiritual outlook at the world around us. Instead of looking for a big empire to defend us, turning towards Allah, turning towards 
uh, ihsan as a means to better understand the world that's around you, as well as uh, a better way to self-identify and a better way to organize society. This is not, by the way, unique just to the aftermath of the Mongols. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, Imam al-Ghazali lived in, uh, he lived in Masjid al-Aqsa in the years leading up to um, uh, the uh, Crusader conquest of it in the year 1099. And after the Crusader conquest, there is also a turn towards the spiritual and Imam al-Ghazali's works start to become much more prominent and popular in the aftermath of the Crusader conquest. So we'll come back also next week to this idea of, um, of sovereignty and the role that the Sufis play in, in creating a new kind of order. And the Ottomans in many ways see themselves as political rulers and political authority and recognizing that the Sufis are the real authority. There's a complete shift in the idea of sovereignty in the aftermath uh, of the Mongols. The Ottomans never could have been who they were had the Mongols not destroyed Baghdad in 1258. And that's simply a fact. Uh, that is the reset button that changes everything. The last thing that I want to talk about today um, is somebody who I mentioned a little bit earlier, Ibn Khaldun. He is a North African Maliki Qadi um, who lived in the 13th, uh, sorry, in the uh, 14th century. Uh, he was originally from what's now Tunisia. He lived and worked in uh, Muslim Spain in Al Andalus for a few years, and then he made his way over to uh, the Mamluk Sultanate. Now, he lives at the same time as the early Ottoman state, but he's totally unconnected to it. All right? He never goes to Anatolia. He never uh, works for the Ottoman sultans. He's totally separate from that. But he is one of the most influential people on the Ottoman Empire itself. He's very, very well read. A few hundred years later, he's translated into Turkish because of the ideas that he promotes. So to give you an idea of, um, of the way that he promoted his ideas, he writes a fairly long history book. Um, in modern prints, it's around seven or eight volumes. But the first volume is his introduction. It's known as the Muqaddimah. Muqaddimah is Arabic for introduction. In his Muqaddimah, he lays out theories of why do things happen in history? The question that we started out today's session with. Why do certain empires rise and then why do they fall? What are the different economic, political, social, religious factors that cause things to happen? So one of his most important theories that he promotes is this idea that every dynasty has a natural lifespan. And he actually says that every dynasty's lifespan is roughly equivalent to the ideal human lifespan, around 100 to 120 years. And he says, during these 100 years, there are going to be three generations, roughly speaking. The first generation is born in the desert. Now, I have to preface this, by the way, by saying Ibn Khaldun is writing very specifically about the North African context, right? So um, he is taken out of context very, very often. I've actually seen an article one time about, um, I think, like Walmart. Uh, trying to explain the ruling family of Walmart through the lens of Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah. It was wild, but it doesn't apply. He's really talking about North Africa, but it, does, it can be extrapolated and applied to, or at least used to understand other situations, and that's what we're doing here. So he says this first generation is born in the, in the desert, and they have a certain desert toughness to them. And um, you know, because they're born in the desert, they don't have any kind of luxuries, they work very hard, they're very tough kind of people, they go and conquer a city and establish a dynasty. They establish themselves as rulers of a civilization. Now you can imagine if you are somebody who was born into a difficult desert type lifestyle, even after you conquer a city and become the king or the sultan or whatever, you're not going to be too interested in the luxuries of that lifestyle because you're a very simple, basic type of person. But that second generation, your children, they might have been also born in the desert, but in all likelihood, they were born and raised in the city and they have the luxuries of the city. So as they are being raised, their parents are constantly telling them, you know, when I was younger, things were very difficult. You have to work hard. You have to apply yourself. You can't just kind of, 
lay back and coast. You actually have to be a very active ruler. So they are going to have some kind of element of that desert toughness that their parents had, but they're not going to be as effective as their parents. Now their children, the third generation, this is the second generation born into luxury, the second generation born into the palace. They have no idea what desert toughness is like. All they care about is the luxuries of the palace and taking advantage of, uh, of their wealth and things like that. They have no interest in rulership and they are actually very bad rulers in general. And because of their bad leadership, they are overthrown by a new dynasty coming out of the desert. So Ibn Khaldun says that every dynasty lasts approximately 100 years. And you know, I challenge you, take a look at just timelines of Muslim history, and you'll see very often dynasties, by and large, tend to last 100 years. The Umayyads lasted around 91 years. The Abbasids, in terms of them actually having power, as we talked about a few minutes ago, they eventually become kind of prisoners in the palace. The era where they actually had power is maybe 150 years. So they kind of um, stretched it. A little bit. Uh, the Ottomans read Ibn Khaldun. They were very, very heavily influ influenced by him. As I mentioned, they translated him into Ottoman Turkish. They read him extensively, and they wanted to stretch this out as far as possible. Again, knowing that Ibn Khaldun is talking about a different kind of um, context, uh, the North African context, they're still very interested in, um, in, in applying his theory to their situation. The important thing that I want to take from this, though, is that Ibn Khaldun is one of the first historians in Muslim history to apply theory to uh, the study of history. Previous historians, as I mentioned, people like Tabari, people like Ibn Kathir, they're kind of chroniclers. They just list everything that they heard had happened. Ibn Khaldun is interested in applying a theory to why things happened the way that they did. So with that, you know, we, we kind of can now begin to understand the cyclical nature of Muslim civilization. Going back over here, we can take a look at, you know, if you lived in the Muslim world in the year 1300, you would be excused for thinking that the Day of Judgment is right around the corner, right? And there actually were poets at this time who wrote uh, poems about how Yom Al-Qiyamah is around the corner. They said, this must be a Jewish and Jews were waiting for uh, the Mahdi and Prophet Isa to show up. This is the end. I mean, this is destruction that we've never seen before. But right at this low point in Muslim history, that cycle kicks in and things are going to change. In fact, the first ruler of the Ottomans, uh, Osman Ghazi, likely was born in the year 1258, the same year that Baghdad itself uh, was conquered and destroyed by the Mongols. So to finish off, I know that we, this course is on the history of the Ottoman Empire and we barely kind of touched on the beginnings of the Ottoman Empire today. The important thing for today's session that we need to understand is the, the lead up and the setup for the rise of the Ottomans. So next week, inshallah, what we're going to do is we're going to actually start to talk about the early Ottoman sultans and the relationships that they had with the religious establishment. Um, but we just needed to kind of lay the foundation to make sure that we we're understanding that uh, kind of uh, on its own terms. Um, so Jazakumullah khair for everybody that, that attended. Uh, inshallah, this was beneficial. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the next few weeks uh, going over this this course with, with everybody. So Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.